So hi. Security has an image problem. And this is not exactly news, right? This is one part of that problem. We're seen as a roadblock to organizations. And the problem with being a roadblock is that just like when you come upon a road full of goats, the reaction to security measures, and often the people who propose security measures, isn't usually, oh, look at all the cute goats. It's usually, oh, for God's sakes, I do not have time to pick a new password right now that has three uppercase letters and two lowercase letters and at least one number and at least two special characters from this list of special characters, but not any of these other special characters because we've suddenly decided that our passwords can't be vulnerable to SQL injection for God knows what reason. What do I have to break, so, or who do I have to bribe so that I can get around this so I can get my job done? And I saw this tweet now a couple of weeks ago, and it really resonated with me. I worked for organizations that had major shadow IT problems because the response from IT every time they were asked for a new feature was closed, won't fix. Every single time, often for years on end. And to be clear, like, hashtag not all security people, right? But also hashtag enough security people that we should actually be concerned about this. We can't do our job if this is the reality for our users. More concerningly, for nice security people, of whom I'm sure at least some of the people in this room are a part, we can't do our job when users think that this will be our reaction. Even if that's not your response, if your users come from someplace else where they had a very unhelpful or hostile um, IT or security team, you have an image problem that they're going to be expecting that of you in the new organization, even if it's not something you're doing, and you're still responsible for that image, even if it's not one you helped create. So the simple answer is, well, maybe we should be like nice to people, really super nice, so that they like us. And that's true on general principle, but it's also not very helpful, right? It's too general to be kind of a specific advice, and it's also impossible to be nice all the time. Maybe not for you. For me, it's impossible to be nice all the time. We need something that has more structure than just be nice in a way where, yes, as Douglas Adams suggested, nobody has to get nailed to anything. Um, but ideally, a strategy that's designed for the real world, where security people have a ton of power and authority, but need to interact with users who might see us as obstructions, or even actually just be scared of us and the kind of tools we use on a daily basis. So before I get on to what the solution is, let me introduce myself. Hi, I'm Brendan. I'm a security consultant, among other things. I'm also an attorney with a deep academic computer science background. Um, I am, in fact, a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. Um, those who take security advice from talks at conferences get pretty much exactly what they would deserve. Um, I also do security, security compliance maturity work as a consultant. So if you like what you see in this presentation, talk to me. But it turns out there's good historical precedent for the situation of this small, very powerful group needing to interact peaceably with the larger society. And for many of you, since, especially if you were born in Europe, this may be a relatively familiar story. Since I am an American and not a great student of history, I actually first came across this entire concept while reading a book called Halting State by Charles Strauss, which you should just, by the way, definitely read. It's about augmented reality and alternate reality games and distributed security in MMORPGs. Essentially, it's about the Internet of Orcs. And just like the Internet of Things, you can still use the Internet of Orcs to attack Brian Krebs' website. So that's helpful. So... In the 18-teens and 1820s, London, for those of you who don't know, London's a big deal, right? I've heard it's important, um, less important recently, but who knows. Uh, so London was growing even more massive, and the police force wasn't doing so. And this is because London isn't one city. London is a ton of tiny little cities, right? And this, includes, this map includes many, but not all, of the cities that are inside the London Ring Road, which is essentially Greater London. And the issue was, in the 18-teens and 1820s, all of these little tiny dots had their own individual constables, right? The guy who, you know, finds the drunks and locks them up, essentially. And policing was entirely local. And the problem is because it was still one enormous mega city, um, you had a jurisdiction that ended every few blocks. So you'd be, you'd be running after someone, and they'd go into another town, and then your jurisdiction would end. And obviously then, like now, we had cooperation between neighboring police forces, but then, like now, cooperation isn't the same thing as unified jurisdiction, especially because the constabulary was also expected to essentially define what the laws were. So you'd have essentially the same laws, like laws against stealing, say, but they'd be interpreted differently from town to town. So this doesn't really work. And this makes things very complex in this rapidly urbanizing society. So to handle the issue of policing across all of the greater London area, the Home Secretary, Sir Robert Peel, wanted to create a London Metro Police Force. 
And there were a couple problems at the time that the population had with this plan. The first one was that the uh, only major European city with a unified police force was Paris. And the police force was not a friendly police force. It was essentially what we would call today a secret political police with all of the negative effects you would expect with the term secret political police. The other problem is that uh, for pretty much the last, like um, the majority of the previous 50 years, England and France had been at war. So therefore, you know how likely most people in England today would be to, if you propose an idea with, hey, let's do this neat thing that France does? They were even less likely than that to go along with this plan. So the fix to this was this fundamental principle. The police are the people, and the people are the police, and the police are simply gave, paid to give full-time attention to keeping society intact, which is the duty of everyone in the society in any case. So I note in the slide that Sir Robert Peel almost definitely didn't originally say this, and in general didn't lay out what are called Peel's principles of policing, though he did discuss some of them both before and after the establishment of the police force. The people, just to give credit where credit is due, who actually set out the nine principles were the first commissioners of the London police force, Charles Rowan and Richard Maine. So Robert Peel, like a lot of people in history, got the wrong thing named for him. And not just for the principles. The reason that London police were called originally derisively, now somewhat fondly, Bobbies, is because of this same Robert Peel. So why talk about the history of cops in London? Because the issues that the police were facing then are strikingly similar to the issues security people face now in organizations. We have a lot of power and a lot of peer into things that most people can't. The population knows this, and they're not predisposed to liking us, because they've seen groups like us before that went on to abuse their power somewhat catastrophically. Also, we're tasked with keeping the peace. Any slip-ups will be our fault, but most people will never notice when we succeed. That's fine. Things aren't about us, right? Larger society has goals bigger than just what we want to accomplish as security people. But we do need leadership to notice that we're important, even though it's our success ensures that most people won't. Because if the leadership doesn't know what we do, then we don't get to stay employed. So we need to balance being essentially invisible to the populace with being close to the heart of leadership without becoming yet another secret police force because that would then terrorize the populace and we can't get our job done. But most fundamentally, we're not the point of what's going on. We don't exist for our own sakes. We exist for a larger purpose. So we have to integrate into a larger society and we need the cooperation of the larger group to make our jobs possible. So to make this work, we're going to apply police stuff to nerddom, just like in this photo. So to describe this problem, it won't be a shock to you to learn that the rest of this presentation is how to solve that based upon Peel's nine principles of policing. I do wanna make a couple things clear. First, I'm not pretending that nobody has ever thought of any of these ideas before. What I think is valuable about using Peel's principles as a strategy is that it's an ordered way for security to work within a larger organization. Simply shouting, be less terrible to everyone, while essentially correct, hasn't actually worked so far. The fundamental principle is that rather than simply saying suck less at your jobs, Peel's principles are a framework to guide you in, I hope, sucking less at our jobs with specific and actionable items. And secondly, I've tried very consciously to apply this framework to my client work, and I've had su some success with it, and I'll tell you about that as we go through. But in year three, however, feel free to come back and ask if it's still working. Maybe it's all terrible. But for me, for now, it's working much better than what I had before, and it seems reasonable when I've told it to other people. So I'm going to go through each of these nine principles, and with each one I'm going to throw them on the projector for just a few seconds. I'm not going to read the quote on the projector to you, because I hate it when people do that to me. So I'm going to assume that you can read, I'll let you read, and then I'll move on. So right off the bat, we have two major items to apply to security operations, and then Brendan killed the projector. There we go. The first major idea is that prevention is the order of the day. This is, of course, not news to security people. There are some nuances to how we should achieve prevention, which I'll get into a little bit later, but the basic goal of security is always let's make sure bad stuff doesn't happen. The second idea, though, is also very important. Now, as you are no doubt aware, the United States has completely lost its mind on the subject of risk. We'll get into other ways in which the United States has lost its mind later in the presentation. We cannot seem at a mass psychological level to understand risk or even compare risk in a reasonable way. We freak out at people who light their underpants on fire, and now we all have to go through naked scanners in the airport, but we hand guns to toddlers, and then we're shocked when things happen. 
We take elaborate hand wavy cargo culting precautions and we blame them on the lawyers or the regulators. But we drive loud, fast cars with no speed limits and we attack plaintiff's attorneys whose fundamental job is to keep everyone safe by punishing companies who hurt people. In the security space, we're told that there are, the only available success to us is no attacks, no breaches, no insider threats, no nothing. Victory at all costs. But by all costs, we don't mean that you can spend an infinite amount of money because nobody has an infinite amount of money. So the way to fix this is to point out the defense and cleanup are in effect alternatives. But that like police prevention and police response, more defense helps prevent the need for cleanup, but does not eliminate the need for cleanup. This is the same solution we use in other areas. A good example of this is the general rule of thumb that if you add a, want to add another nine of, of uptime to your infrastructure, you need to double the cost of your infrastructure. And so you can make an outrageously available solution like say Amazon Web Services does, and it will cost a huge amount of money to build and it will be very reliable. And it will still go down sometimes just like Amazon Web Services does. Once you've engineered it well, it'll only go down in some unexpected or complex or even fully random way. I recall one of the AWS postmortems from a few years ago where the explanation for what happened was that the ground fault circuit interrupter, which is supposed to detect when bad things happen outside of the data center, like you know a power line is down and it's shorting to ground, that kind of thing. It had been recently tested and complied with all of its tests. It was perfectly fine and it just broke and decided that outside was bad and had and detected a fault where there was no fault and cut over to battery backup and then the batteries failed. So it's like, and that sucks. So nothing bad happened except that Amazon fell over for no reason. In Calgary, in Alberta, in Canada in 2011, one of my favorite examples of this happening was a major data center had an explosion in its battery room and it specifically blew up the equipment that cuts over to batteries. So it blew up the thing that switched into the UPS room. And so therefore, because it was the switch, it was no longer able to connect to mains power, even though nothing bad happened with mains power. So the data center unplugged itself. These kinds of complex failures don't happen often in a well-engineered system. The prevention isn't worthless, but bad things can and will eventually still happen. At a certain point, you will have prevented all the preventable issues and what remains will be chances. Here's the second principle. So this shouldn't be a shock that a public approval is required, but it sure seems like it's a problem. I've watched organizations that are simply at war with their internal uh, groups, right? Whether that's IT or HR or internal security or any or all of the above. And these groups eventually completely lose their mind. And it doesn't even have to be a normal IT, like a normal support function. In one particularly awful corporation, I watched a company's internal political struggle between essentially two directors who didn't like each other be transformed into a material software incompatibility where their team's software could actually no longer talk to each other. And then they just stayed like that for about a year and a half, just gibbering because nobody could make these two people stop being jerks to each other. So beyond that pretty ridiculous edge case, there's a deliberate call to action on this point. Security, again, isn't the mission of your organization. It's a critical part of making the mission happen, but it's not the goal. And it's not even the goal at security first organizations. If you think of Open Whisper Systems, for instance, who make Signal, their first goal is not security. Their first goal is and has to be to create a usable messenger. In fact, it has to be more usable than the insecure messengers, otherwise people won't switch to it. Then a critical part of achieving their larger goals is security, absolutely. So security is a critical part of their value proposition, but it's not the only part of their value proposition. So given this, remember that you are the support organization as security, and while the rest of the company doesn't get to win without you, that you can and will more quickly lose without them. Now, they don't need to have an entire marching band saying how awesome you are, though that's always cool, always take that if offered as a job perk, but you all need to be on the same side. Here's the third principle. So let's talk about willing cooperation. I'm not going to name and shame anyone on this slide, even the people who deserve it. I'm simply going to point out that there are several very prominent security people in the industry for whom I otherwise have a great deal of professional respect, 
whose approach to security within companies seems to be to shame people who aren't security experts for not being security experts. And this bugs the crap out of me. I've not found a single person in a professional setting whose response to being abused on a daily basis is to say, well, I should just do everything in my power to get better so that one day this person will like me. Because if we saw that in a professional context, or if we saw that in any context, we'd call it an abusive relationship and we would be right. So why is it okay to say, how dare this support staff member do something that we would consider to be foolish, right? Like for instance, how dare this support staff member take a USB drive that is silk screened with the name of their insurance company that was mailed to them in an envelope bearing the name of their insurance company with a card explaining that they're sending them documents for this policy year um, on this USB drive. And yes, it was phishing, just to be clear. But why is it okay to shame these people for using every sense they have and saying, you know, this doesn't just say, you know, dearly beloved in Christ, I write to you with instructions on behalf of the Prince of Nigeria, right? It looks real. It just wasn't real. So it's human nature to vent about things. I've had clients come to me with exquisitely self-inflicted wounds, right? Things that are both debilitating to the organization and very, very funny. It is perfectly fine and perfectly human to want to tell your friends about these things. You can have a drink, you can unwind, and you can tell stories. You can even do so in a public forum. Um, in the United States, the DEF CON Comedy Jam, which popularly known as the Fail Panel, used to be excellent at doing this, telling the story without shaming the user before they ended at DEF CON 22. Remember, however, that when you rant about how awful non-technical or non-security people are in public, and I don't mean telling stories, but saying how stupid users are, or how the normals don't really get anything, you run the risk that you will make it more unlikely that users will bring things to you. And it's not a direct thing. If you're a consultant, it won't even necessarily be the company you're ranting about, let alone the user. But if your public reputation is that you have no empathy when people bring mistakes to you, people will stop. And that's a problem. I've learned incredible things about very important security breaches in uh, regulated corporations that has ex explicit requirements about security from low-level employees whose job isn't security. In some cases, their job didn't even involve computers. They used computers as an incidental part of their day, but happened to tell me something about the computer that became very important. One story that's not mine, but which you might have seen on the internet, came from a financial institution in the United States with extensive internal controls due to the information they handled. So a random re user reaches out to the IT department following the IT department's like monthly security awareness newsletter, right? You know, three tips you didn't know about passwords. And the user reaches out and says, hey, you guys always seem so nice. And you always say that if we have any questions, we should just come to you. So I have this question because there's something that like, I'm sure it's fine, right? I'm sure it's not a big problem, but it's always weirded me out. And I wondered if you could tell me how, like how you're securing this. Okay, sure, go ahead. Well, you know, we change our passwords every six weeks. And yes, we don't do that anymore, but nonetheless, we change our passwords every six weeks. And when we do so, my manager comes around with a clipboard and makes us write all of our passwords down so that she can have them. And also, when we go on vacation, she makes us give her our proximity cards so that she can get into our offices. Because again, it's a core financial institution, so every, law, every office is individually carded. And she says that she needs this because this is what allows us to have a better work-life balance. Since she has our passwords and can log into all of our accounts, she can cover for us if we're homesick or just you know home after work hours. And this is why part of why our team is so efficient and why our bonuses are so good at the end of the year. But you were saying that we shouldn't share our passwords. So I was wondering if you could tell me how you're helping her protect these passwords. And of course the answer was, oh dear God, what is going on? And followed by rushing in and eventually firing a whole bunch of people, uh, including yes, the manager and her assistant. So how long had this been going on? A year. Why did this low level, not primarily technical user reach out? Because they felt like they'd be safe doing so and they wouldn't be taunted if in fact there wasn't a problem, which was what they expected to be told. We need people to point out that this is not a fortification. We need people to point out that emperors are sometimes in fact naked. Those people will mostly not be security people. Security only happens when everyone cooperates and you don't get cooperation via abuse, even when it feels good. So keep your rants to your friends. They're the ones who buy you beer anyway. Here's the fourth principle.
So we're going to set aside physical force for this principle and several other ones. Because if you're hitting people as part of your standard security practice, you have many problems that I'm not likely to be able to address. As I said in the intro, this time, as part of this framework, no one should have to get nailed to anything. So let's talk about compulsion. Please stop that is a natural part of security, right? Please stop plugging things into your computer. Please stop clicking things. Only click the good things and not the bad things. And I realize there's no way to tell them apart, but we will hold you responsible in the test. Please stop emailing that, right, et cetera. It's not inherently bad. In many cases, this comes down to please stop hitting yourself. The problem is that if every time somebody asks you a question, the answer is no, then people will stop asking. And they will stop asking even if you were in fact doing your job and all the questions they asked are in fact terrifying. I don't think saying no is wrong or bad or unreasonable, but unfortunately demonstrably chills our ability to participate in the larger business. So we have to do something else. Now, here's a big secret. So if you work in consulting and you're showing this to your clients, you might wanna skip ahead a minute or so. But security people don't have an answer for everything because we're not the whole larger team. When people come to us with questions, we make up the answer. Of course we make up the answer, right? We make up the answer based on our training and experience and analogies to previous things that we've seen. But we do make up the answer, right? This shouldn't be a shock, but it seems like it is. So let's use the same technique that another group uses for the same reason. If you've ever seen improv troops, they make up their story as they go along. And when someone asks a question, the answer to every question is always yes and something. So I spent a few months trying this very consciously with a client. And it is very hard. Because when an engineer comes to me and says, hey, can I shoot my own eye out? It is very hard to say yes. And you have to say yes. You can't say no. Remember, because no is the wrong answer. Even though no is the correct answer, no is still the wrong answer. So this and bit becomes very critical. Yes, you can shoot your own eye out. But let's talk about how to make it safe. Maybe we'll give you some goggles. And hey, if you wouldn't mind goggles, let's see if we can get you into like a full face shield thing. And also, I know, I know that when you shoot at your own eye, you're not going to miss. But on the off chance you do miss, let's see if we can get you some like body armor type things, right? And try to make it safer so if you should happen to miss or should slip. So handled delicately, this produces one of three outcomes. Maybe the person goes back to their engineering team and says, hey, Brendan helped me out and showed me all the things I needed to do so we could implement this I shooty outy feature. But it seems like there's a lot of protections we have to take. So maybe we should redesign this feature without so much of the I shooting. Then you win, right? You got what you wanted. But you didn't have to say no. Option two, they still go forward with operation shoot your own eye out, but they use the protections you designed. So it's pretty good, right? Option three, they still go forward with Operation Shoot Your Own Eye Out, and they ignore all the protections that you devised. But now they know that failure is in fact not only an option, but a very high likelihood. And so perhaps, now to switch metaphors, they're able to get out of the car after they've driven off the cliff, but before the car explodes in midair because it's an action movie, right? Any of these three options is better than the outcome you would have gotten from saying no, even though no was the correct answer because eventually they'll just decide that you want to crush their dreams. They don't want to talk to you anymore. So over some time of actually doing this with clients, I was able to change how I thought about these questions from how do I make your stupid idea as painless to me personally as possible to one of how do I help you achieve your goals, even if your goals seem a little odd. And that's the developer perspective, right? Because developers don't get a task themselves. They, there's always something coming on from on high. So, but having spent some years doing security and not developing for a living, I found I'd lost that. And it was nice to get it back. Ultimately, again, remember, the business wants what it wants. Your role as security is to enable that. And you can terminate individual truly dangerous ideas. That's the exercise of compulsion. No, you can't do that. But every time you do that, however, you lose political capital that you need to get that willing cooperation. So try yes and as a way to make things happen securely. Here's the fifth principle, and you'll notice here I highlighted one chunk in red. The justice or injustice of individual laws isn't something you should turn a blind eye to because we're not police, because security is in fact often choosing what policies to implement or not implement. So we have more of a leadership role. So ignore that bit and just read the rest.
So let's talk about good humor and friendship to all. I hate to see just don't be a jerk because it's kind of reductive. So think of this as a challenge. Can you make people who you dislike, because that happens, not notice? Sometimes this works. I've talked to people today who've had very similar stories to ones I have, where you fought like cats and dogs for months on end with a client. This happens especially if you're a consultant and making them do something unpopular. And then at the end, you get a letter, an unsolicited letter to your boss saying how wonderful you are. And you're like, wow, I really hated you. I'm a little shocked, right? But sometimes it works. It doesn't always happen. But try it. Try to keep up appearances kind of no matter what. And I'm not great at this, but it is worth trying because sometimes they don't notice that you actually personally dislike them. And you can make this, the organization move forward regardless of that. It can work. So now let's talk about individual sacrifice. So what does that mean? It's not like we're actually being asked to jump in front of bullets as security people, setting aside all the odd stories about defending data centers with shotguns after Hurricane Katrina. So the way I look at this in terms of security is that, yeah, you're not expected to defend your networks with shotguns, but you are expected to go the extra mile or kilometer to make things work. And this goes with the fourth principle, don't just say no. When it's not obvious how to make something work, figure it out. And this might mean you have to talk to other people, who I know are sometimes scary to security people. But this is one of the advantages of having so many conferences, right? You get to meet people who have very different expertise than your own. In the, just the past couple of weeks, I've met security people at a few conferences I've been at who do very odd things that I might actually need to know someday, right? And I didn't learn every one of their secrets, but now I know somebody who I can call. For instance, I met a person who runs a very large network, and as part of that network, he runs IPv5. Those of you going, wait, is there IPv5? Yes, there is. It's experimental reserved, but there is IPv5. It is a thing that exists. So here's the question. How do you firewall IPv5 and prevent it from running amok around the rest of the networks? Well, I actually don't know, but the next time I have to deal with a large-scale network that has this, and it's mostly academic networks that have this, I know who I can call, and I can figure out a way. And it's going to take some extra time, but it is possible. So this is why we have so many conferences, right, is that we can work harder. That's why most of them are on weekends. Let's talk about the sixth principle. So again, we're going to set aside the threat of physical force, because if that's what you need at your workplace, something's gone farther along than it's covered in this talk. So the thing that strikes me about this principle is that IT and security have a huge amount of tools that creep people out badly. Things like the wall of sheep, if you've ever seen it, which is you know very pedestrian to most security people. Oh, of course, if you use a terrible protocol, we'll put your username and password up on the screen. Or for extra fun, DriftNet, which is something that often happens in the wall of sheep village at DEF CON, but you might have seen it as well. And it's great, it just shows you alive every image being transmitted across your network for a network tap, which leads to two things. One, it scares the heck out of your users, and two, remember that you cannot unsee that which you have seen. Or simpler things like watching host names from live network capture, or even perfectly pedestrian things to us, like exchanges on demand remote wipe of any uh, mobile device that connects to the exchange server. These things can scare the heck out of users, and they should. They're enormous coercive tools. And don't say that well, good users should have nothing to be afraid of, because if you think that, you are wrong. And I will discuss this with you as at much length as it takes to describe this to you, but everybody has things that they're concerned about. And when faced with, you know, well, yeah, the security guy in my company who wears a lot of black t-shirts can also nuke all of my phones, they're gonna be concerned and they're right to be concerned. And a lot of security and IT people see being able to use this level of monitoring and control as a perk. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way. I've had, for instance, an IT security person who was pretty good tell me he habitually monitored usernames, or excuse me, host names coming over the network because he found it soothing to know that everything was working, right? Because if you see DNS lookups coming over the network and then it suddenly drops off massively, you see a quarter as many, you'll know that something has gone wrong, right? That isn't part of the normal cycle of the day. And you'll be able to immediately diagnose the network before the first person calls you. And obviously using monitored, or sorry, using automated monitoring isn't optional for network security anymore, but it's not unreasonable for humans to resent human eyes watching us constantly. So how do we solve this? Make and then make public to your users a sort of rules of engagement. Say yes, we can, for instance, wipe your device, 
This is when we can technically do it. And this much smaller subset of times is when we are going to do it. The same with network monitoring or email monitoring. Make it public, integrate it into your policies, and then follow the policies. And make it clear that just looking at email because you can, or just looking at network because you can, won't be tolerated. The same as any other major policy violation in your corporation. So make it clear to your team, and beyond them, make it clear to your users that the special access that security is given is both a trust and a burden. Here's the seventh principle. So the security team is the organization, and the organization is the security team. And I don't know if it's just human to organize into teams and then be a jerk to the other team, but it sure is heck a problem in security. We do this with normal users in organizations, which hurts our ability to serve the organization, but, and because we're not better than the rest of the organization, and it's critical to remember that. So how do we get over this barrier between us and everybody else? What I've found helps me the best is to get in there and pull, actually work directly with the developers or any other group. If you came to security from a coding background, this is fairly straightforward, right? Get in there and try to fix a bug, any bug, a small bug, one time. See how the workflow is. You don't have to do this constantly, but if you can, try to do it from time to time. If that's not possible, because of, for instance, if you're in an organization that doesn't use DevOps, you might have separation of duties requirements that say, no, security is part of operations and you can't write the code. That's fine, then do something else. Help the developers with threat modeling or feature design or user stories or documentation. Help them with anything. But particularly in an organization where there's a significant age difference between security and engineering, it can be helpful to make everyone feel like you don't think you're better, including you. It also helps directly to show you where developer pain points are. For instance, how many of you know what Vagrant is? Only like a third of you. Okay, so for the rest of you, Vagrant is like Ansible or Puppet or Chef, right? It's a configuration management tool, but it lets you spin up local developer instances in a virtual machine. If you just type Vagrant up and give it a recipe, and it spawns a virtual machine that has your development environment, and it's a great tool. So, what those of you who've used Vagrant or know what Vagrant is may not realize is there's a relatively new feature in Vagrant called Vagrant Share. And Vagrant Share generates a three random English word key and then lets anyone who connects to like correcthorsebattery.vagrant.com punch directly through your firewall and connect to the developer's virtual machines running locally on their laptop. It is automated firewall punching as a service with direct root access to something local inside your network. It is a screaming pile of terror for people who design a lot of networks. It's also a great way to solve certain problems in distributed development teams. So if you have people running around a lot of the internet, this may be something they're using. And they're not just doing it because they're crazy. So if you work with the teams, you might notice that they're using this and help them find a way that doesn't scare you to accomplish the same goals. For instance, maybe we should spawn a Zen server that you guys can spin up individual instances on. And we'll put that into DMZ so it's not behind our firewall, that kind of thing. The point is that knowledge is good. And yes, while I know the security people are incredibly busy because there's an ever-increasing number of vendor questionnaires to fill out, this pays dividends from a relatively small investment of time. Here's the eighth principle. The takeaway here is that we're not in charge, right? You've heard me say this before. We don't decide how the organization moves from the way employees act, to the way the policies are implemented, to the security strategy for the corporation. Since you're not running the show, remember that you don't get to make the final decisions when people violate policy. That decision goes to HR or the CEO or whoever. Generally, they would be the judiciary in a Pelian sense. So feel comfortable outsourcing that. Finally, the ninth principle. So security can blend into a larger organization, right? Like, just look at this. You can't tell which one of these people are security people. They all just look like huge freaking nerds because they all have call sign badges that are glowing on their chests. And of course, this is DEF CON 22. This was my group of ham radio examiners. So we are, in fact, all huge uh, nerds. And we are, in fact, all security people. So security people shouldn't be about itself. Secu sorry, security as an organization shouldn't be about itself. Users should be able to go about their day without thinking about security per se. We know from study after study that when users feel like every moment is consumed with security, they just disable things or break things until they can go back to whatever their job is. 
My favorite study on this topic from a few months back was a hospital in the United States where the IT staff had implemented passive infrared sensors under every desk to check when people were physically present at the workstation. The idea is you can, as soon as they walk away, you automatically log off the machine or lock the machine so that you don't expose personal health information to whoever might be walking by. And this was very unpopular. And then all of a sudden, all the complaints about this stopped. And they're like, have we achieved success? No, they hadn't. What they'd achieved was getting every single um, uh, computer in the hospital to be, have a small Dixie cup added to it to put over the sensor so that from the sensor's perspective, someone was always present. And then they could go back to doing their jobs. Security doesn't win in situations where the users feel like we're always watching them. We win when users get to do their jobs. That's how best to look excellent to management. That's particularly how best to make sure that we can change the narrative of security as a roadblock. So what comes next? Well, that's, the, that's what comes next. We'll end with a call to action, because for one thing, all the cool kids end with a call to action now. And for another, beyond simply applying these principles in your own roles, there are a few more specific things I'd like you to do. First, it's an obnoxious cliche that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Unfortunately, this whole security as roadblock idea often comes from this precise problem. Well, that solution would involve risk, so it's a bad solution and it's an awful solution. This is another facet of the risk intolerance that we discussed earlier, but it has the amazing ability to stop forward momentum towards lower risk solutions. Since that wouldn't be perfect, we shouldn't move forward at all, often means we shouldn't move forward out of our house, which is on fire, onto the street, which is true, might at some undecided point in the future also catch on fire, but which definitely has less fire on it than the house currently does, because the house is completely full of fire. This is also known as the heckler's veto, right? Your solution sucks, can't cause paralysis. End it in yourself. And if you're curious, yes, I've done this sometimes too. It is a hard habit to get out of. But also don't tolerate it for others. Explain how risk works and that some inevitable, or some risk is an inevitable, and then move forward. Secondly, stop the large scale hating. This is a CISP. It's a certification. You might have heard of it. It does not, as far as I can tell in this whole paragraph, require its holder to be aligned with Satan in any way. And yet there's a huge number of people who go, oh my God, CISPs are awful, right? We're faced as an industry with several very difficult cultural challenges. I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to speak about them on the O'Reilly Security Podcast that came out just two weeks ago. I think it's still the newest one. And it's called Security as a Monoculture. So you can go listen to it if you're curious. But I will summarize very briefly. A corollary to the police being the people and the, police and the people being the police is that security should be like all of the people. And around the world, somewhat surprisingly, we still have this faction of the security industry that openly discriminates based on gender or race or appearance or sexual orientation. I don't know why we're having trouble stamping that out in security, but it needs to stop right now. Beyond that, however, we have this pernicious separation based on the path someone took to get here. We're a great field in no small part because it doesn't take a PhD to work in security. I've worked with incredibly talented people who only had a high school diploma. The flip side of that, however, is that sometimes people say, well, my God, we don't need a college degree, so I'm not going to look at anybody who has a college degree because it puts your brain in a box, man, and then you can't think outside the box. And it's not a more helpful bigotry. Let's also stop discriminating against people from liberal arts programs, right? Or people who have a CISP, yes. We should make sure that we include all the diversity we can because our users already do. Finally, speak up. There are a few people to whom I truly look up to in this industry. The common thread that runs through each of them is that one could count on them to speak up on behalf of people who need it and who can't speak themselves for whatever reason, usually that they don't have a seat at the table. If you see your company doing bad things, not simply technical decisions with which you don't agree, but things that are in fact wrong and hurt people, speak up. If you see a company that's still hurting users' privacy, whether deliberately or negligently, or behaving in an illegal or unethical fashion, or just making the world worse, you have a duty to speak up. Well, we're not the only thing in the company. We're charged with protecting the trust of our fellow employees and the user of everything that the company makes. What you do might protect users from embarrassment, from harassment, or even from violence. That's a huge responsibility and it's our duty to live up to it. In fact, I'd go farther than that. It is imperative that we build systems to protect people right now. The United States has just made a decision that's likely to cause pain for a wide swath of people around the world. We could just give up. But instead, I propose that we should double down on our sense of duty and build systems that protect everyone. Security only gets to be the adults in the room if we act like it when it's hard. And that's something we should look to take from 
if not perhaps the typical police officer, but instead from the paragon of policing. We should do our job in service to all, regardless of the difficulty. We should be the historical fucking geek who implements the historical technical imperative because we're the people we were always waiting for. Thank you for your time.